Roger Schroeder. Can you give us a demo on it? Yay! <clears throat> well, thank you for inviting me out tonight. Actually, you saved me a lot of money because uh, I think this is the same night as the auction, and every year I would go to the auction and spend money on tools that I don't need, and you know what? <laughs> Fine, I'd rather be here talking about carving. Uh, you know, I'm curious to know, while I start unloading some of this stuff, what got you, what got you people interested in wood carving? Frank. Uh, Frank, right there. Frank Napoli. Yep. Frank, you're like the prime domino here. <laughs> well, I, I brought a few things when I joined the main, the, the main, the main club. Uh, I brought a couple of things in that I had caught, and then Mike had this new thing. He's really interested in starting to improve. And it was nice to see that people had an interest. I brought in something, you know, there's something coming in. Amazing pink. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Charlie, are you just oh, yeah. visiting? I'm visiting here. I want to see how the power carving can be incorporated into the wood turn. Okay. Well, we'll hopefully uh, give you a little taste of little taste of what's going on. Um, I'm kind of a hybrid guy. In other words, um, I use traditional tools, but I also do, I combine um, I do a lot of roughing out with power tools and hand tools and sometimes vice versa. I'll rough out with hand tools and refine with power tools. So I brought in four different tools that I use that all have to all require electricity and give you an idea. In fact, one of them I'll let you come up and use so you can get a feel for one of them. Others are a little too dangerous. You need uh, some other equipment, but I'll talk about it in a moment. Um, <laughs> Do you wear one of these when you park? No. Mm, should. Really should. Especially there are so many accidents. You know, I'm all for safety, and having a leather apron is really a good way. I notice people like Frank Klaus come in, and I think it's all for show because I see very few woodworkers who wear leather aprons. But you know, when you're using sharp, too sharp hand tools, it's a really a good idea to wear one of these, particularly with power carving, where you, you might be carving in your lap. So this will protect you. Um, there's a Monday, a Monday group that meets in, meets in Merrick, and it's uh, strictly wood carving. You go there, you, you have lunch, you, you enjoy uh, camaraderie of, uh, of other wood carvers. And one of the guys there, who's been carving for quite some time, was using a, a knife. Now most people in a small setting use, um, do knife work because it's easy, it's portable, and you know, you're not creating a lot of chips, a lot of mess. Stabs himself in the stomach. Wasn't wearing an apron, I don't think. You know, this, this is pretty thick, pretty hard to cut through this. So really, it is a really good idea. Unless you've been carving for like 20 years and you feel comfortable without it, great. But it's, it, is, it is a wise thing, a wise investment. Um, dynamite tools, I think they sell an apron for what, 10 bucks? You know, 10 bucks? I got, I'll, show, I'll show you little bits that I use for some of my detail work. They're 10 bucks a piece. So you know what? It's really a good investment. Protect yourselves, guys and girls. It's, it's a good thing to have. Um, I started carving in 1976, and, but I also started at the same time woodworking. So being a woodworker, I got very quickly introduced to nice looking woods, mahogany and walnut and maple, and I found that I had stuff left over. So I started carving the, the leftover stuff. And I found that, you know, some of that stuff is darn hard to carve with the old uh, traditional tools. Let's see if I have what I mean by traditional tools. These are traditional tools. This is typically what I use for a mallet. I know there are about eight different kinds of mallets from rubber to uh, vinyl to you know, everything imaginable, but this seems to do a really good job. It's uh, brass, you can get them also in steel, and it, it really carries. You want to you feel how heavy that is? What do you use that for? Even though it's, for? pardon? What do you use that for? Well, the these, are my, these are my push tools or tools for carving, and you're simply hitting oh, the wood. I'll show you how to, how to, I brought in a, uh, an unfinished carving and show you what you can do with these, but, you know, these are the traditional hand tools. But you can run into a lot of woods out there that are just really difficult 
to uh, difficult to work with these traditional hand tools. So I found myself going to, I think the evolution was this. I started with these tools and then I said, you know what, this is getting really tough. So I went to files, rasps, and rifflers. And I found I was getting, removing a lot of wood with them. Um, at last count, I have 350 or more files, rasps, and rifflers. And you know, I probably use like four of them. <laughs> That's typical of all of us. I mean, uh, if you talk to a professional wood carver who has been trained, let's say in Europe, where you go for four or five years, they'll tell you that they may have 300 carving tools like this one. And how many do they end up using? 25 at the most. Because what happens is you learn how, but this is a whole other lecture, you learn how to use one tool for many different jobs. Okay, so I evolved to files, rests, and rifflers and found that they were kind of slow going. And then I discovered power tools. But you know, there are really three kinds of power, power carving tools. Let's use this kind of general category. One is really the, the roughing out tool. And um, I have an example of that. The other is power grinding, where you, where you kind of, um, you're taking the place of files, rasps, and rifflers, and you're using rotary tools to grind away the wood. Slower, but you know, a little bit more refined. And then there's power sanding, and I do an awful lot of power sanding, which can also create nice effects and give you a nice smooth surface. Because imagine trying to get a smooth surface with these tools on something like maple. I brought in this unfinished carving, which is maple, and believe me, I, I haven't carved a wood as hard as this hunk of maple since I once did a, um, I did a little sculpture out of lignum vitae. Lignum vitae, I can only get a, ch a little chip at a time. I ended up using, those of you who are familiar with carving tools, a number three tool that was a half inch wide. That's all I could do. Anything this big just bounced off the wood. <laughs> So you kind of evolve, you learn, you see what works. I still like using these tools for uh, a lot of work, but boy, when I can do some power grinding or sanding or even some power carving, I'm in, you know, I'm in great shape. Um, uh, where to start? Incidentally, if, you, if I miss anything, you all get a copy of Woodcraft Catalog? They have a couple oh, yeah. pages devoted to uh, what they call power carving, and you can see in more detail some of the tools that I brought in. Um, and a little bit more description of power. I don't have all this stuff memorized. I know what the tools do. I know how effective they are. But here, you know, it, you can probably phone in or check woodcraft.com on the internet, get a catalog sent to you. And you know, it's also a good reference. I don't always uh, order tools from here, but hey, you know, if I want some resource or some reference and good uh, background material, I go to this. Um, what do you think the ultimate carving tool is? May surprise you. But before I, let's see what I have here. Before I, uh, let me start with another question, I guess, or, or add another question. How many of you have been to Cooperstown in the last 25 years? <coughs> when you go in the main entrance, what do you see? Think, come on. Big bat. Big bat. Big bat. A uh, couple sculptures in the main entrance. Yeah, what sculptures? Yeah, there's three sculptures. Well, this is one of them, Babe Ruth, when you go in the main entrance, and you'll see also a sculpture of Ted Williams. These are life size, they're made from laminated basswood. I think most of you have probably worked with basswood by now. And yeah, these are big blocks. How were these brought down the size? They're brought down with a chainsaw. Take another good look at this. Most of the roughing out of this life-size sculpture of Babe Ruth was done with a chainsaw. Why a chainsaw? Because there's no other tool that's going to remove wood like this one. Here you use a bandsaw because you need a bandsaw, my God, that weighs about 8,000 pounds and is, is half as big as this room. But a chainsaw can really do an awful lot of wood removal. So I think that next to with a, with a your typical shop, um, shop bandsaw, is probably the the chainsaw is probably the biggest, the best of all the power tools. But you know that's the big stuff. Most of us aren't using. I've done a few things using a chainsaw. Very effective. I find it very dangerous to use. I find it's messy. Um, you know, just a lot of a lot of things you have to weigh with it. But boy, you know that there are not too many things that beat that. Um, little anecdotal story. I was out 
I think it was 1988, I was visiting somebody in Gig Carver, Washington, and he said, hey, you want to go and see a, the results of a chainsaw competition? Well, out in the state of Washington, there are, they have these trees that are four feet in diameter, so you have a lot to work with. Now, you can't put a pattern on a tree because it's gone. As soon as you start ch chainsawing or sawing away, you've lost it. So in other words, all up here, you have to visualize. But I was, I was watching what this one guy did. It was, he was the winner uh, using probably a four foot chainsaw out of this huge section of log. He carved a skin diver in reeds. It was awesome. I was like, how can anybody do that? But you couldn't do it any other way. If you did it with these, something like that, with these traditional tools, you'd still be working on it. And that was 21 years ago. So, <laughs> you know, there's a place, there really is a place for power tools. Um, where should I start? How many of you have a router? Almost everybody does. No router? No, he has not used. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have a designated router for her? A designated router? No. She has to, well, I guess she has a drill. Even my wife has a designated router. <laughs> Something to think about. Anyway, most of us have a router. And you know, this can be a really ineffective carving tool. If you're doing something called relief, you all know what relief carving is? It's where you're taking basically a flat, in most cases, a flat board and you're relieving. You're removing wood usually in layers or you're, you're leaving enough so that something is raised or at different levels. Imagine a landscape where you have a sky, you have a barn, you have a tree, and then you have a stream in front of that. You're talking about four different layers. You can very effectively rough that out using a router. Now, I'm not so, you know, freehand is okay, but there are, are some tricks to this. Um, I didn't bring in a landscape, but I do a lot of these uh, nautical eagles. This is missing the head. But this is mahogany, a little tough to carve with just hand tools. And also I like to raise the edges, the top edges of the wings. Now, if I did all this by hand, got removed, we're talking about almost three quarters of an inch of wood, man, I'd spend the better part of the day doing that. That's a heck of a lot of work. So the thing is, using some power carving tools, in this case a router, how can I really effectively cut this away? Well, I came up with this idea. Actually, no, it's actually not my idea, but it's mine showing how to do this using a plexiglass base, which will sit over, which will sit over a piece, and work my way work my way uh, over the piece. Um, let's see, what kind of, I'll show you the bit if I can get that uh, straight bit. Uh, well, yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't know why it's... Can you all see the bit? I use one of these spiral cuts. Spiral cut. Yeah. Spiral. spiral cut. Interesting, at least a kind of a like a like a, a wafer, like a cereal, a little like oh, like, a, like a cereal flake. It's very strange. I've never seen anything like that. Usually, you know, when you use a router, you get all kinds of odd, odd-looking um, chips, but this creates something different, and it's very it's very aggressive and very very easy to use. So, for up spiral or down spiral. They make them both ways. Um, I think I use the one that brings the, the stuff yeah, so up. That would be an up spiral. Up, up spiral? I think that's it. Um, three quarter inch plexiglass, I'm sorry, three eighths inch plexiglass. Why three eighths? I found that quarter inch tends to sag. There's a lot of weight with this router. I mean, you can use a lighter. Trend, Trend makes a uh, lightweight router, which you could also use, but I took what I had at home and it doesn't flex. You don't want half inch, it's just too much, and you're losing some, some of the room with a bit. Um, now, these things, I guess, are you call these riser blocks, and so you sit over the piece and you beat the wood away. I'll show you what I did. Uh, Lord, why the keyhole shaped uh, opening? Pardon? Why the keyhole shaped opening in the, in the plexiglass? Um, it's to suck the dust up. 
Oh, okay. It doesn't, I find that I don't have a powerful enough router. I always joke about having a, a cheap Lowe's uh, shop vac. And the first level, I take this off at a quarter inch at a time. The first level, the, the router, the, the vacuum will suck the wood up. Come the second level, not so much. And by the time I get down to like half inch or three quarters of an inch, I'm hardly getting any wood at all. So I got a mess, but you know what? I just stop, sweep it up. Two, if you want to feel, you want to feel how smooth that is, and pass it around. To take that much wood off probably took 20 minutes. That's pretty fast. Roger, do you move the router and the thing, or do you move the wood underneath the router? No, I'm moving this. Oh, okay. In other words, I'm going over like this, over the piece. Um, piece I use a lot of MDF, so the piece is clean. You see, down. I screw it to the MDF. MDF is cheap. You get it at a Home Depot, Lowe's. It costs what four dollars uh, for a you know two by four sheet. Yeah. And when I ruin it, I throw it away, and I don't feel I've lost much of anything. Of course, you got to be careful when you put the screws in that you don't put them in too far, <laughs> and you end up hitting your hitting them hitting the uh, the points with your router bit. Um, so after that, now that. That was not done, um, that was done just with the router bit, Joe. But if I want it even smoother, and you'll feel, that's pretty darn smooth. I'll take a palm sander. You know, another good, another good power carving tool. One of the, um, what do you call the round kind palm sander? Uh, orbital, orbital. Orbital. Take an orbital, you know, a cheap orbital, uh, I think I have a DeWalt orbital palm sander, and just go in and smooth it out, and boom, I have a nice flat, reduced surface. So, pretty effective. I've saved myself hours and hours of work trying to go from, from that, a solid block of wood, step down to get a smooth background. Um, incidentally, I, I could use power carvers in here, but by that point, I go with uh, traditional hand tools. So, that's, um, this is one of the first power tools that I've, I've come up with. And it really does work well. Um, I did a five foot eagle, but I wanted to, a flat relief carved eagle, and I did it with this. And I think the whole eagle took me about 45 minutes by hand an entire day to get it down easily. Would you say, Frank? If you, yeah, I have a I don't like to use uh, really hard wood, so. <laughs> yeah, you see, that's. That's, that was a problem I ran into. I was finding that, yes, I love working with basswood, and there's something called sugar pine that is really, really soft. And in fact, there is no, I don't think there is any power tool, power carving tool that can beat me on sugar pine with, with hand tools. In other words, I think I'm as fast or faster using these traditional guys. Um, but if you want something, you know, that looks different and nice, I painted, gee, mahogany is a great wood to work. Uh, walnut I found to be a lot harder, a lot more difficult. I remember someone giving me some quarter sawn walnut. It was impossible to carve. I mean, big, big, wide pieces of it. Man, it just resisted. Um, maple is just ridiculous. I mean, just so darn hard to work. I'm not talking about rock maple. I'm talking just soft maple is difficult. Um, other woods, butternut, when you can get it, but uh, butternut's a great wood, it carves very easily, it has a nice looking brownish grain, but there's a disease out there that's, um, it's a virus that makes the tree um, susceptible to wood borers. So what's happening is people cut down the trees and it's full of these little pinholes. You know, maybe for, for some barn siding like wood, but it's really, it looks pretty bad. So a lot of the butternuts are just getting uh, ruined by that. It's kind of a shame. It's one, really is one of my favorite carving woods. So again, using a router, this was uh, what eight quarter, eight quarter wood. Uh, wanted to raise the the wing edges. Used the router, worked over it three stages, stepped it down, and voila! In 15, 20 minutes, I'm down to a really, really smooth surface. Boy, and the, that spiral bit is about. I know you can get bits that are just flat on the bottom, but the spiral seems to work really well. It's just so aggressive and so easy to use. I was amazed at how quickly, even the hardest wood, it just really nicely eats it up and, and it's gone. Um, 
And you're probably wondering, what is Roger doing with an IV stand? Not anymore. You were in a hospital and you refused to give it back to them. I've walked out with a right to attach the, attach the, uh, to the uh, needle in my arm. Um, many, many years ago, I met a bird carver who was using one of these uh, for a power carving tool, which is really the one I use more than any other. This, ladies and gentlemen, is called a Fordham, and it is really an amazingly versatile carving tool. Um, you'll find it in the Woodcraft catalog, but not a, they don't sell it with this horsepower. This is the third horsepower, the most, the strongest of all that are made, or the most powerful. Uh, the Fordham was developed, I believe, for the dental industry um, and the jewelry industry, until, I, I think, until more powerful tools or faster tools came into being. This is, this is all that was around for a very long time. It has, uh, it's been around for decades. You don't s see them much until the 1980s when bird, bird carvers discovered these things. These Fordham sets, you can do an awful lot of roughing out uh, quickly. If you have woods like, someone mentioned, who mentioned Tupelo before? Steve. Okay. Very hard to carve with hand tools, but with power tools, it, it's, you get some really nice results. Uh, Tupelo is one of those strange woods that has interlocking grains, so you can get to, you can cut cross grain with power tools, and you get some really nice details on it without having to worry about breakage. It's almost like flexible in places. It grows in the swamps. Much of it comes from Louisiana, and really, uh, you know, if you go to look on on do some Google search for carved birds, you'll see some amazing things that were done mostly in uh, in Tupelo. Um, this unit, it's an only has a foot switch. Uh, this costs about, I think I checked it out, Highland Hardware, located in Georgia. You get the, uh, the hand piece, you get the motor, third horsepower, and the, and the foot switch for about $319, which is a good price. This is what I use really more than anything else for power sanding and power grinding. 14,000 RPM and has a, enough power. Uh, if you were doing, let's say if I really want to work in burl or something super hard, I would go to an air tool. I would, get a, I would invest in a five gallon um, compressor and you can get air tools that are rotary and reciprocating, 30,000 RPM, although you wouldn't want to use something like this, it'll, it'll just disintegrate. But 30,000 RPM, uh, air tool stop instantly, a great thing, but you know what? It's a big expense and probably overkill for most what most of us do. Um, uh, I'm going to show you some of the bits that. Now I have on, on here you've got a a sanding attachment. Can you all see this? get a good look at it. I do a lot of power sanding and this this is the piece here. I'll show you how it comes apart. Let's see where. There's a sleeve in here, a metal sleeve. And you have to turn it. Pull the sleeve the out. On, what's the shank on that quarter inch? Quarter inch, yeah. And here's a rubber cushioned, feel it? Okay, it's soft. And that's all it is. This this little bit, this thing here costs, oh, I don't know, $12, $13. Not bad. But the secret, the real secret to making this a, and a wonderful sanding device is this stuff. This is called cloth backed sandpaper. Now, what I'll do is, Feel leverage? Yep. Ah, my favorite place, Clean Sport. 
Point score, yeah. Absolutely. Point score. And it really, it's great stuff. It's really great, great stuff. It's pretty durable. You know what? The, the other thing I discovered about cloth back sandpaper is point score doesn't. I'm not sure they have the big sheets, but you can get four inch wide rolls of this stuff and use it on a palm sander. It really is good stuff because you don't have that creasing on the uh, on the edges and it's terrific stuff. It comes in, let's see, what grits? I think it's uh, 120, 150, 180, 220, um, 220, 320, 400, 600. So you have a lot of variety of this stuff. I don't go, when I power sand, I don't go any higher than 220. I find that's really enough. But I'll pass this around too so you can see what, see what that is. That's 220. What Steve has in his hand is 180. So I can get an awful lot, you know, really an awful lot, uh, awful lot done with this tool. Right. When you buy bits for that, do you have to match them to the machine? You know, like it's the RPM or whatever? Um, it's 14,000 RPM, so almost everything works. Oh, okay. If this were an air tool with 30,000, man, I think you'd have a lot of metal fatigue and your, your, your sh shaft would tend to get out of, uh, oh, okay. you know, out of square or whatever very, very quickly. So yeah, 14,000 is good. Also, with this you can, um, you can kind of uh, adjust the speed so that pushing it all the way down We'll give you 14,000, but just a little pressure will give you a lot less. So, you know, I discovered, as you probably all know from woodworking or whatever, that there's a learning curve to everything. I think the biggest mistake I always make when I get a new tool is to see how aggressive it can be. You know, you gotta go in there and you gotta really, you know, go at it. But you know what? It's, it's, I think it's better to go slowly with something. I, um, I even use, a disc sander, you know, you all know what that is. I invested in a Delta 12-inch disc sander. I do shaping on that thing. It's amazing, you know. I, even though it's flat, you can still do some, you know, take a piece and you can get get some um, some Very major impressive. major wood removal on it. Yep. But what I discovered is, I discovered is, is that if you're not careful and you got a really fresh 120 sanding disc on there, man, you've lost too much material. So what I tend to do is everyone say, oh, you shouldn't do this. I tend to, I tend to let my sandpaper wear out and that's the best bet. When it's kind of worn and then it's not so aggressive, then I can kind of take my time with it. But you know, this, I mean, all our tools can be very aggressive and I think it's learning really to, to take it easy with things. Um, I'll show you some of the other tools. None of these was made by the Fordham Company but these all work on the tools. This is called a file cutter, and it actually acts as a file. It's, in other words, it's, you know, has a kind of spiral twist to it. Okay, it's sharp. These things are, these things are interesting. These are called um, cuts all bits. And what they are is, you can pass it around. They come in all sizes and shapes. They're teeth. So, some of these you can buy are extremely aggressive. I mean, they are really, really aggressive wood hoggers. But these, carbide? touch it. Yep, it's all carbide rich. Carbide, yeah. And the ones that aren't so toothy and sharp do, you know, are a little gentler with the wood <coughs> removal, but they all work very, very nicely. Joe, you want to pass that one? And if you want to take a look at that. When you cut with that one, does it? Does it leave a really rough finish? Uh, believe it or not, no. If because that is not an aggressive cuts all bit. That's you know pretty. Uh, that gives you fairly smooth results, and then you can follow up with a sander, and you got you know and you're in pretty good shape with that. Um, the problem with that is, how do you clean these rod? You burn it off? You um, I don't think. One of those latex jobs that you use for cleaning, um, oh, sanding, sanding yeah. stuff. That's what I use on it. Um, if you, Bob, if you were working on something uh, and like a really oily wood that gets stuck in it, you'd probably have to use a blowtorch. Yeah, but if you burn them off, yeah. burn them off, it doesn't yeah. hurt the material, I guess. Because they they will get clogged. But you know, most of the woods I use, like mahogany and walnut. Um, maple, butternut, 
they really don't clog. I don't do much with rosewoods because it's just, you know, they're just too darn difficult. One of the things, aside from the apron, when we're talking about safety, is using one of these things. You all, have you, do you all know what this is? Oh, yeah. not, hi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a Kevlar glove. This is interwoven with steel threads. Um, anyone have a knife? Nobody has a knife? <laughs> <laughs> Do you see these? Yes. Yeah. I hope I don't prove myself wrong. Otherwise, <laughs> anyone know the emergency number for the uh, Kings Park ambulance? You should. You should really be able to be able to go like this without without cutting yourself. Okay, that's, that's the advantage of Kevlar. Um, if you stab yourself, it'll probably get between the weave, but if you're doing this, you won't, you won't have a problem. Um, if you give me one of those cut saw bits or the other one. I do a lot of shaping, holding the, holding the piece, holding the piece in one hand, like this, and I'm working here with the tool, and I'm going like this, and then boom, all of a sudden, I end up feeling it gets caught in the glove, and the whole thing kind of gets gets knotted together. Uh, a friend of mine was doing doing some shaping with one of these things, took a quarter inch chunk out of his thumb. Do you know how long it takes to grow back a quarter inch thumb? <laughs> I, I mean, he had bandages on for like half a year. I mean, so it's really, you know, it's these are wonderful tools, but it really pays to have one of these because the worst that's going to happen is it's going to get caught and it's going to wrap around, and that's all that's going to happen. Okay, your your hand, your flesh is going to be protected. So two good things to have. The same thing with this. You know what, it's gonna bounce off a leather apron. It'll get knotted up in this, and it'll scare the hell out of you. First time I have it, I'm like, God, you know, when you got this thing stuck in here, what am I gonna do? But you unwrap it and you keep going. Um, do I believe in, in after falling off a horse, getting back on it right away? Yeah, yeah, I'm like that. I remember uh, doing some roofing when I was a kid, and, and it was a 30, 30 foot drop to the gutter, and I slid down, and got held onto the gutter, got right back up. Because, you know, hey, you, know, you don't want to be afraid to get on a roof again. So yeah, I mean, that, it's really important. I think every, every time I do a project, I think in terms of wood, design, um, time, and safety. You know, how safe is it? How safe are my techniques and, what, and, what, and the tools I'm using? And uh, if you're using a knife, and probably a lot of you are for the, uh, for the club, you know, this is, it's, a, it's a, a sharp tool. It's a, yeah, it's a dangerous tool. Someone once said a very famous carver. I love this. I actually had this written down and, and taped up in my shop. A dull tool is a wrong tool. Not only because it doesn't cut, but it's dangerous. You know why it's dangerous? Because you're forcing it. And the more you force, the more likely you're going to have an accident with a dull tool. I'm not talking about a butter knife. I'm talking about one that's you know really not honed up and you know, just really right. So it's something I always keep in mind. And I guess it goes for really a lot of our tools, but yeah, a knife is a dangerous thing. And this thing is really, really dangerous if, uh, if it comes in contact with you. Um, I think, let me uh, plug this in and show you what a little bit of what it can do. Can someone hook me up? Okay. So that way, the way you take the take a cutter or a sanding attachment or anything out, you put. Okay, mm -hmm. this should have been attached. Actually, this is a slightly different size wrench. But you put this pin through the uh, through the handpiece. You take a wrench, quarter turn, and out it comes. Take. 
bit. Put it in, you can put it down all the way, you can bring it out a little bit. Yep. Eighth of a turn, and you're in business. That's all there is to it. It's really a simple tool, flexible shaft, because you know what? You can, you can it'll actually function like this. There's a, a flexible shaft that runs in this thing, and you know, it'll go in, uh, in almost any configuration. I guess you could actually tie this in a figure eight and it'll still turn. Really an amazing machine. You don't pull too tight. Pardon? As long as you don't pull the figure yeah, as long as you don't pull it too tight. Well, eventually what will happen is you may get a little bit of stress in the, uh, in the shaft and it'll come through the, uh, through the rubber housing. Anyway. Right. Do, you, do you lubricate the... Oh, you catch your neck up. Hmm? you lubricate the uh, cable? Um, you grease it, in other words, you take it out and you make sure that it's, the grease will stay in here for a lot of years. Um, there's not too much in here that has, that needs maintenance, and let's see, up in here, this is pretty, you know, this is pretty, uh, maintenance free. Make sure I have What's the model of that? Um, it's the, the TX series, and I checked it on the internet. And Highland Hardware 319, again, I don't think you're going to do, get a better price. Would you say Pilot Hardware? Highland, Highland Hardware Highland. is cool. Yeah, they're located in Georgia. They, uh, now, you know, talking about safety. Here's a, here's a, here's a dumb thing I did. I, was, I, put this, I put this in, okay, had this hanging here. Left it down like this, stepped on, stepped on that. Now, you know, that's okay, but what happened is, what happened is I had my hand near it, and this chain wrapped around my hand. It looked like I was in some kind of a bondage movie for about three weeks. I had all these, uh, all these uh, chain marks on me. So, you know, I learned. I am very careful about not leaving this thing in here. You pull it out and put it aside, and you're okay. So, if you see, you put it on. You have a slow, maximum speed, 14,000 RPM, and it's pretty good. The, um, this is not the thing I want to be working on, but... Pardon? No, it won't stand straight. Well, <laughs> it won't stand straight, but just to demonstrate. Oh, Bob, thank you. That's cedar wood. Yeah, we may think it's kind of we may think it's kind of frivolous to be using power tools, but I'm giving a lot of thought to this. As we're getting older, Steve, you're not getting older. You're too young. You're too young too. You're too young. You're not getting older. When you get older, like I'm in my 60s, I find that my joints are aching when I wake up in the morning and I'm tired and I'm stiff. And you know what? What? Yes, myself. Where are my, where are my traditional carving tools? What do I do with those things? You're on the right hand side. On this side. You know how to get home, Roger? Pardon? You know how to get home? <laughs> what do you think? What do you think pounding? On these things, is, it's is doing to your joints after a while. Man, you know, it's a real. It's, I'll tell you, it takes its toll. If I spent like the last 25 years, which I have done, you know, doing this kind of stuff on hard wood, man, you know, eventually you get what carpal tunnel, tennis elbow, you get shooting pains up along here. So really, something to think about in terms of carving for the future. If you if you really want to do this as a lifetime pursuit, it's really worth uh, considering you know, taking some learning to see what you can get done with power. Um, I think, like I say, this saved me, this saved me four hours of you know, hammering, hammering away with, uh, with carving tools and you know what, I, uh, I saved my body for another day. Really, really good thing to consider. So not only is it, is, are there issues of safety, there are issues of really uh, wear and tear on your body, which I guess is, fits into that. Yes, this one. With a pattern with that? 
Um, or is he rolling ahead? You know, I've studied the, the guy who did these originally, a guy named Bellamy. He lived in the uh, 19th century. He, um, he carved for about 60 years of his life. If you found an original Bellamy Eagle somewhere and put it on auction, they're going for over $100,000. Over $100,000. That's just for his bread and butter 24 inch Eagle. Very simple thing. You know, a head, some, some feather definition, something like this. $100,000. Um, some over, some go, going $120,000, and one big one he did, four feet long, went uh, on auction, 19, let's see now, 2005, $660,000. The reason I bring this up is I'm very, very interested in knowing what, what becomes of our stuff. You know why, the, why it's so high, why they go for such big prices? Americana. People really love Americana, and that's what we're all doing. We are all Americana folk carvers, whatever you want to call us. And you know what? I'm hoping that in another hundred years that our stuff won't be just discarded, but will be appreciated. And you know, you know, you see it on the Antiques Roadshow. Your great 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 grandchildren will see it on the Antiques Roadshow and say, hey, yeah, it's my great great grandfather. He did that, you know. The guy <laughs> says, oh, worth hundred thousand dollars, or maybe they say. Uh, $20. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can tell me, get it off the table. <laughs> Bob, what is it, cedar? Yes. Yeah, cedar is pretty easy to carve. I'm not sure that, um, you know, I would put this in a vise and just very quickly, very quickly uh, carve away at it. But you know what? I'll tell you, for more symmetry and. You know, you can get more aggressive colors if you want to, right? I mean, you know, I mean, you know that's... There are some where that, that, that have like these um, mace look, that look, look like mace maces yeah. with yeah. these big hairy teeth on them. And those, those to me, I have a couple of them. They are just so dangerous because I'm not sure that even this will protect me if they get caught. I'm thinking what will happen. I don't want to. I don't want to play with fate. But let's see what happens. Okay. Now this with my hand, man, I'd be. Uh, you'd be calling the ambulance. I'll tell you. So, yeah. You know, it, it pays to know really what the drawbacks are. This is a wonderful tool. You can remove an awful lot of wood. It's designed for removing wood, but it's so what happens? You know, it'll it'll get away from you. I can still feel it my fingers when it grabbed. So. Mm -hmm. um, I think I should. Yeah, I didn't want to really make too much of a mess, but I thought I should. We have a boomer. If I can find all my pieces. Just so that you know, the emergency room here in uh, King's Park, in St. Catharines, okay, it's $3,000 walking into the front door, even with nothing wrong with you. So, you try not to go in there. <laughs> Good enough. Did you uh, when you buy, when you buy that, um, of course, I'm spread out all over the place. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Over there. The no. sanding drum, where is the little sanding drum? Looking for the, uh, that's cushion back sanding piece. Under the table. Isn't that Oh, yeah. Right. And I need the. Uh, uh, you see what happens? I'm just walking by. Watch his lips. Careful. Um, this is what I can. When you buy this, this sanding attachment, you get one of you get this plate with it. And what this plate does is it gives you a template so that you can put it on your on your sandpaper or rolls roll sandpaper, whatever you have, and be able to cut out a piece that will match this.
Roger, did you ever hear of a place called Smoky Mountain Coppers? Yep. I guess if you go through enough catalogs, you always find something that the other catalogs don't have. Always there some years ago. Anyway, remember, just you put the pin through with this forum hand piece, put the wrench on, put it turn, and boom, you're back in business. Take your sandpaper. There is a okay, a notch. Put it in. Wrap it around. You know, I think the one piece that has keep it two seconds has a seam. All right. You take the aluminum sleeve. Got it. Push it in there. Pieces using this oval and it tightens up the paper. Or a twist. I'm in charge of the plug here, pal. Thank you. Thank you. He's because I know I'm going to step on this. He's the ambulance driver. And you're in business. So I should wear my glove. Although, you know, this, this won't cause really you know, too much damage. You're not going to get really too, too chewed up with sandpaper. Even 120 grid, this is 180, but. I don't worry too much about that, although I still worry about it. your fingerprints. <laughs> <laughs> you wear a dust mask when you're on? Uh, well, you know how smooth that is? You wear a dust mask when you're on? Uh, and hearing protectors. You know, after, after what, uh, I started carving in 1976, so with that in woodworking, my hearing has really taken a beating from, you know, decibel pollution or whatever you want to call it. And I don't know, I, that, you know, that's another safety feature. Are we all wearing dust, dust masks and hearing protectors? Mm -hmm. I sometimes see these demonstrators at the, at the woodworkers club and they come and they're not wearing any protection. Uh, someone once said that Norm Abrams has the greatest hearing in the world. But you never you never see him wearing anything. He's turning on this, uh, you know, the table saw all the time. You know what noise, what damage that does. Well, he does work all the time. He does put. Uh, yeah. I guess in the early days when I watched, yeah. he wasn't wearing uh, around it, anything. So anyway, if you feel, Debbie, if you feel that it's nice and smooth, yes. and that's done, that's just 180 really? grit sandpaper. You know, I wouldn't even for something like that. I wouldn't even go much higher. 220 maybe. But certainly not 400, not, you know, nothing like that, really. It's, um, most, most hardwoods will polish up really with uh, 220 grit paper. So what have I done? Well, I've pretty much gone through the paces of the Fordham. Um, it's, a, it's a wonderful tool. It seems to be virtually indestructible, although once in a while you'll break a cable, but hardly ever. Uh, it is kind of expensive. The, the third horse, I'm sorry, this is the third horsepower is more expensive than the quarter horsepower, but obviously, you know, it's how much power you want. So I, uh, actually, I got this because I reviewed this model for a magazine. So that was a perk, you know, you get the stuff for free. And, you know, with it, but yes. Does that one have a switch on, on or off? Nope, it's all down in here. That's the only way. My oh. old one has the switch, which is nice. Incidentally, you can get you can get a table model where this is um, where you have a a rheostat on, and you just turn the rheostat to to control your speed. But I like this because uh, some of you scroll saw. Do you ever use a, a foot switch? Some of you do. I think Joe you use a foot switch. Why? What's the advantage? You can control the speed with it and. Uh, Take your foot off the switch, it stops. Okay. Yeah, I mean, how fast does this take? It keeps both hands on the loop. About four, you know, three, three, four seconds. That's not bad. Um, I mentioned earlier that if you're using air, almost instantaneous. I don't know why that is. 
in other words, a compressor with air, and where you're getting really a tremendous uh, power on it. So yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it works well, pretty much indestructible, and it was really a good investment. I just love this tool. So for power grinding with, with some of, with bits like this, it's wonderful. For power sanding, it's unsurpassed. What I've learned over the years of, let's see, how many years have I been using this? About 20. Um, you can get, if you let the paper, let the paper extend over the, uh, over the rubber cushion shaft, you can get in really fine details. They also make this, this is three quarter inch, you can get a half inch. So you get some really fine areas with this. I mean, it's just great. It really is. It's just, can't say enough about it. Um, there is a smaller, I guess you might say a smaller. What do you use? <coughs> right. The detail. No, we'll save that for later. Um, this is called a Dremel. This is an old model of it. But you know, this does a lot of, a lot of good stuff too. You can sand with this. You can do some nice detailing work. Um, it's it's pretty lightweight. I don't know if you all heavy that is. <laughs> Not heavy at all. The other thing, what I've noticed, what I've noticed with the newer models, and uh, my friend over here, Joe Pasolacco, who is also a member of the Woodworkers Club and the Scroll Saw uh, Sig, is that with these newer models, you can buy a little stand and you can use this as a drill press. Because if you're scrolling, you know, have you ever tried to, to get a really fine drill into, you know, the typical DeWalt uh, three, three eighths uh, electric drill? You know, they just slide out. But with this, you put it into your uh, little drill press stand, bring the lever down, and it works. So it becomes multifunctional. Um, what can I, what kind of bits? This is called a stone. I'm not sure if it's ceramic or what it is. Uh, small, but they come in a lot of different sizes and shapes. Yeah. It is really, it's quite amazing. These are. Mr. Zoom. Yeah, let me give you. Let me put this down a moment and show you what. Okay, this is a, a sanding roll. <coughs> what it means is you have a shaft and a little piece of rolled-up sandpaper, which you can get, which you can do some nice fine sanding with. Just pushes right on top. Okay. This is called a ruby carver, which means that it's impregnated with rubies. And this gives you a certain kind of cut. It's not super aggressive, but you can get a pretty smooth surface with it. All different shapes, incidentally. This is kind of uh, what you call this cone shaped or bullet shaped. Here's something else. Still another thing. I mean, I have hundreds of these bits at home. Hundreds that I've gotten from distributors and dealers, and they all work pretty nicely depending upon what kind of texture or wood removal you want to do. And here is what I use most of all, as fine as this is, this is a diamond bit, which means that the, the little spear pointed end is impregnated with diamonds and you get an extremely, extremely smooth cut with this. So if I want to get, let's say, if I want to you know, if I don't feel comfortable with my knife work and I want to get some, uh, remove some, some wood in some tough to get out areas, this is a uh, beginnings of a Santa Claus or kind of Victorian Santa. He'd be probably, you know, he would hold a staff in one hand. If I wanted to get some, some wood out in some uh, tough to get out areas that I can't get out with my knife, I would use one of these little diamond bits. Perfect. Absolutely perfect. Charlie, you were asking about what? Turning and Turning and power carving? Yes. Yeah, for detail, texture. A lot of you know, a lot of this stuff, if you can if you can figure out ways to do it, it's right. it's really workable. Um, particularly on these darn hardwoods, which are just so so daunting. Really so so tough to work. So let me show you what those I can do. The bits that you had there for the Dremel, those wear out in time? Um, the diamond probably won't Not wear the out. Diamond, but the uh, ceramic. Like the yeah. Ones, the rubies. yeah, they will, but the thing is, the good thing, Charlie, is that they're cheap. Right. So, a set of diamond bits, little ones like that, that I pass around, probably 15 bucks mm -hmm. for, you know, five, I'm not sure what they cost anymore. I mean, this thing is, I don't know, a buck. It usually comes as part of a set, right. 
Right, I have to say. So you can get some nice textures with this. You want to feel that? It's just, you know, I use it. So if you would plug me in. I use a lot of them with the screen. Now I would say this little, uh, this little um, bit. What am I gonna? You want to what am I gonna do with it? I'm looking for a foot switch. I'm not sure what the RPM is on this. Uh, if I want to put in some detail on the hair, and the beard. Since there are so many hundreds of bits for the Dremel, it's really, you can always find something, something for a particular texture or, or look that you want. Uh, this is also pretty cheap. I'm not sure what a, a kit costs, a kit meaning that you get this plus a lot of bits and maybe some other, some other kinds of attachments. $80? I'm not sure. Joe, do you remember what you paid for yours? No, I got it as a gift. It's, it's it's around eighty five dollars for those. It's the one with the with the cable. Oh yes, they also have those which are like many <laughs> many Fordhams now. Um, I don't know. I just got the regular uh, regular one. The regular one, but it comes with it. Yeah, yeah. Really, an engine on that, and a flexible chair. Yeah, there's a lot you can do. Oh, incidentally, why the uh, why the IV stand? Well, um, it's a good way so I don't have to store this thing. It's, you know, I can push it out of the way into a corner of my shop. Um, what I also have in my shop is this. And you may, I picked this up from a carver. I suspended a pipe, a three, what, is, what do they call it, three quarter inch plumber's pipe, the kind you use for bar clamps, you know, when you buy the pony clamps and you, and you put them on the ends. This is called, I don't know, I call it a carabiner, which is what mountain climbers use, but it's basically a, a clip, and I have a little bigger one. So I ran the, suspended the pipe, a four foot pipe, parallel to the ceiling, and lo and behold, I can hang this up and I can run the Fordham, and if I guess if I had an eight foot pipe, I could run it all, all over my shop, or I mean, I can do pretty much wood around anywhere I want. So that's an alternative. I mean, this is a very, these things, I, I, I don't even want to guess what, what a, an IV stand costs, but it's going to set you back a couple hundred bucks, I'm sure. But you know, a piece of pipe from the uh, from Home Depot is going to be what, eight bucks, something like that, for a four foot length, maybe ten. So lo and behold, you know, this costs like a buck somewhere at some store, and boom, I can suspend this and you know, have a lot of lot of play. Uh, but again, you know, it's nice having it up high. It really keeps it out of the way, and it also keeps this from kinking. Not that kinking is such a big deal, but you know, why, why take a chance that something is going to go wrong? It's right. expensive to replace this stuff. For, for what it's worth, uh, I, I choose approximately the same thing. I, I only use it in a small area of my, uh, over my bench. I have a hook hanging from the uh, joist. That's another thing. Uh, when I first started using this, that's all I had was a hook. Just a simple hook hanging up, a big hook nonetheless hanging, and I would clip this on, and boom, you know, I was in one place. But again, if you want to be a little more mobile with this and move it around, well, hey, you can hang up, suspend the pipe from your ceiling, and just kind of uh, put stops on the ends of the pipe. Actually, I guess I used uh, eye hooks, and then, uh, what do you call those things, uh, those twist tie things, like yeah, those tie. plastic. Wire tie? Right. So Good use Good those. Good to keep the pipe from moving, and also the uh, the eye hooks prevent this from going off either end. Simple solution. Um, so I've shown you now the Dremel. Again, you can get this. You can get a very good kit with this. I think they even have, with someone said, a flexible shaft for about 80, 85 bucks. Not a bad deal. Plus, I think they always throw in a lot of bits. You know these these kinds of things. I think that's a good way to start. Rich, I'm like you, you know, I want the biggest and the best right away, but sometimes maybe, uh, <laughs> maybe you, want, you want to start a little simpler. I mean, this, you know, the thing with this is, 
I should have pointed it out. I can change, this takes a quarter inch collet, but I can change this so it takes small bits like this. So it comes with a set of collets. In other words, I can take this ruby carver or ruby bit and use it on the Fordham. Hey, so really, I, this is an extremely versatile tool. You're not limited to the quarter inch shaft. If I want to be really aggressive, I can you know, certainly be aggressive. If I want some fine detail, hey, I can use one of these or that little diamond bit that I passed around. And you saw, if you all saw this, you see how small that is, but boy, for some really fine detail, you can't be beaten. And diamond will last forever. I mean, this thing should really last forever. Okay, I have one more tool that I want to show you, and I will allow you, because I don't think anyone is going to get hurt, I will allow you to try it out. And this is the true power carver. Now, what I have started is... I call this my, uh, my crazy horse carving. Um, somewhere out in, I think, is it South Dakota? These people started carving this monument of crazy horse out of a mountain. Yeah, and it was a, an, an Indian on a horse. It's taken 50 years to do the head. Now, what do you think the chances are they're ever going to finish this? I think, you know, it's probably unlikely. This thing has been sitting around my shop for two years. It's maple. Oh, please. Oh, man. I just, I like doing uh, fish, and I like doing fish that are almost in the round. I call this like three quarters in the round, which meant that it's really going to be, if you see, you see the black lines, how much I plan to take away from it. And I started, I said, oh, shit, that's too hard. It's too hard. And then I got out, I was using... Make a lot of pens out there, Sean. Right. Hey, man. Can I make a suggestion? It's curly. It's nice. it. I've done that already. You know, I started started with this. Two and things in a motion. It's taken, <laughs> it's taken forever. And you feel, eventually you feel your whole body right. vibrating. You spend the morning doing this. Oh, my God. Why am I doing this? When I, when I got out this power carver, it's called a, uh, an Arbor Tech power chisel. You can find one in Woodcraft. It's about 170 bucks. And you know what? I'm, I think I'm a little bit faster with this, but man, I mean, this, it's so effortless. And again, when I set every, everything up, I'll let you come and try it. I'm, it only works when you push into the wood. So in other words, it's, it's not going like this in your hand. So as soon as you push, you feel that I think it reciprocates to something like 14,000 uh, vibrations a minute. It, it really does a job. It really is amazing. So I'm going to put these away when I finally get around to doing this thing. I'm going to put these things away and I'm going to use this Arbortech power chisel. And I think I'll, uh, it's, it'll take me a while, but I think I'll get there. Um, let's set up and see what we got. <laughs> yes, and anyway, you don't need to, uh, I use the same without an apron or without a glove. I mean, it's really, uh, it's really pretty simple. Yep, we use. Before about MDF, it's cheap. <coughs> uh, kind of hard to see, but I two screws. I also use these things for staining. Two screws in the back, and boom, I'm done. Uh, the only problem I have with this kind of a setup is if I'm if I'm using the hand tools, eventually the uh, the holes get a, get kind of big, even in the wood with a lot of pounding. Yeah, you know, then you have to go and really kind of start over and make drill new holes, and but not such a big deal. I noticed 
Bob Urso has some really nice carving tools. Have you all taken a look at them? Uh, I did some magazine work and I used to um, test tools like that and do reviews of them. And uh, flex cut is a good, it's a good tool. Bob also had you have some German made two cherries. Two cherries. They're good. Those are really, you know, I highly recommend those. Um, this happens to be from Woodcraft. This is Swiss made. These are good too, but you know what? You'll do well with two cherries. They're, they're husky, they're, they're, they hold an edge. They're really, really, really fine for this kind of, uh, this kind of hand carving. Anyway, this is a tool. Roger, for that, for the Fordham, can you get a, you can get an adapter to use that kind of blade in the Fordham, can you? Yeah, but I don't find it has much, has enough power. Oh, okay. this does. That's the one, that's what I call, I don't know, I hate to say sissy carving. It just doesn't, you know, it just doesn't have it where this does. I mean, this is a rugged, there's a lot of machine here. What does this weigh? Anyone good at figuring out weight? About, what do you say, about four pounds? Yeah, maybe a little more. You put one hand in the in the back, one hand up here. You press it into the wood, and there it goes. I mean, it just it really goes. So if you uh, so plug me in, let's hope this works. the grain, you kind of working downhill. Just for the sake of the tape, thank you very much for the show. It was very good. Thank you.